Okay. Welcome back um, to part two of the painting process on this panel, which I started this morning. Um, I took a break a little bit ago to let the piece dry uh, because the surface was getting really gummy due to all of the layers of work that we had put into it this morning. Um, and you'll notice the piece looks a little bit different than it did when um, I turned the cameras off. That was because as I sat here and looked at it, um, it, it wasn't, it, it felt forced. It didn't feel, it didn't feel, um, it didn't feel right. So I got the sander out and I took a sander to it and it, it took off a good amount of the paint that we had laid down this morning. Um, a lot of this lighter blue um, and purple and some of this green up, green and um, that's from the underpainting or, or the piece that was here before we started. Uh, and then this darker sort of catacomb of darker marks. Uh, these are all what was left after the sander hit them. And I was feeling like this painting was, was really quite forced earlier. Um, but now when I look at it, I, there is, there's a horse here. I can definitely see, I can see a couple of different horse heads in, um, in the composition, but I think that's the direction that I want to go. The mice were clever, but they weren't quite right. So maybe that, that's an idea that we'll, I'll get to explore in another piece. Um, but sometimes I have to let an idea go, no matter how much I love it. I have to just let it go because it isn't the idea that's best suited for this particular particular piece. So it still feels gummy. I really had some thick paint on here and I've been blow drying this for a while. So we're gonna be we're gonna be tender with this. Um, like I mentioned this morning, usually I give these pieces a lot more time to dry in between and, and the process of doing a demo kind of changes things up, changes that game up quite a bit. Um, but just to reiterate, this is an 18 by 24. It's a hardboard panel. It's like a masonite panel um, that I, I love to work on these surfaces because they they take a lot of abuse. Uh, and this is acrylics on the panel and this morning I used a number of different water soluble tools. So if you're interested in watching that first session um, in real or uh, the, in watching that first session, it's on my Facebook page as a, um, it was a live video, but it's there now as a video and you can watch um, that session at your leisure if you like. Um, and I just want to mention again, if you are interested in uh, watching or learning more about my process and how I work, there's plenty of that content over in my Magic Space classroom on my Patreon page. So reach out to me, message me, and I'll get that link to you directly if you can't find it on my um, Facebook page itself or on my website. Just reach out to me and I'll gently nudge you in that direction. So on um, Patreon space, I put at least one video up every week talk about my process, what I'm learning, where I'm getting inspiration from, the things that I'm stuck on. I do critiques of my own work, uh, all sorts of different stuff there. And that's for um, online students. So you can do it at your own time, on your own clock, or whenever you have the opportunity to sit down. So um, I am going to get started in here. But before I do that, let me pull Pull up my Facebook page here on my laptop since I'm here alone, and this will give me an opportunity to follow along with you and try to answer any questions that you might have in real time. So, let me turn the volume down here though. Okay, so yeah, as I, as I work along, if you have any questions, throw them into the comments thread and I'll periodically take breaks and check in on my laptop and do my best to answer your questions um, in, in real time or as close to real time as possible. So um, Patty, yes, sanding, sanding does make a huge difference. Um, and it's always unpredictable to me 
because um, really what sanding does is it takes off the topmost layers. So it's essentially sort of shaving off whatever texture I built and um, leaving the marks that were underneath that, which I haven't seen in a while. So it's kind of a guess. I don't, I didn't really know what would happen as far as value jumps or any of that sort of thing um, when I hit it with the sander. So, oh, hey, Scott, it's good to see you. You see a Shetland pony, I do too. Actually, I see a totally different pony when I look at this piece in person than when I do when I turn around and I see it on the camera and reversed. Um, it's There's definitely like a pony profile head and a nose here with the mane and this is the eye when I'm looking at it in the camera. Um, but when I'm looking at it here in person, what I actually see is a head here that's sort of rearing or throwing itself up into this darkness and then there's this there's a smaller neck here, and I and I like that energy. I like I like the push and the pull that happens with that more so than um, the cuteness of a um, pony profile. So I'm gonna go with the more animated version of the horse that I see at this point, just because that sort of represents my original intent when I started with this piece, which was to paint some of the fear and anxiety uh, and stress that I have been feeling. Um, the last, the last, it feels like forever, right? So anyway, okay, well, Scott, I'm delighted that you checked in and um, it's nice to know that you're watching. We miss you here. Okay, so let me get a fresh glove on. Again, I'm working in acrylic paints, but because I use some colors that are toxic, like cadmiums, uh, I want to make sure that I protect myself. So... I am putting on a glove because I know I will ultimately get my hands in here and I don't want to have to worry about what I may or may not be touching. So I am going to go ahead and I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw the horse in that I see here and, and um, I'm just going to kind of sketch him in here for you so that you can see the shape that I'm, I'm responding to here. I don't know if that's showing up for you, um, but this is, this is the shape or the, the force, the energy that I see pushing into the piece. And I'm gonna use a reference photo at this point um, because I'm not, this morning you saw me draw a mouse from memory and while I most certainly could draw a horse from memory, um, I want to make sure that I get the planes and the angle and the musculature of the neck a little bit better, uh, a little bit more representational. This is a far more complex shape and form, and I do want to, or I do plan on abstracting it, but I also want to make sure that I have a strong enough representational basis to start with before I start pushing those abstractions. So I'm going to use a reference photo. Now I opened up an app on my phone called Unsplash. This is an app that has uh, copyright free images and you can search it by keyword. So um, I have previously uploaded this or set this app up and I'll show you the image that I, I downloaded and cropped this image. I'm interested in the white horse. So that is the, um, that is the shape that I'm going to be drawing. And I'm going to zoom in, I'm going to zoom it in on my phone a bit, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start to draw. So I'm going to start, for me, it's easiest if I start drawing with the eye. So I'm going to start by drawing this eye. And when I draw, I love, I love to work in contour. So when you see me draw, Thing that really gets me going is contour and line and I'm starting to realize that that is just because I'm so in love with line and fascinated by the relationship of lines to form so that utter fascination is what drives my own interest
as I'm drawing this, I can see that there are some threads of that gold marker that I put in earlier that practically line up perfectly with the um, some of the lines or the edges on the horse itself. So I'm going to play with that. I'm going to maybe exaggerate that a little bit myself. While you probably cannot see these lines that I'm drawing on your own, they're they're pretty visible to me. I'm gonna take that chalk chalk out. And again, this. This piece right here, this feels very much like the forelock. I love, I love the energy that that seems to have. So I've got this drawn in. I'm going to put my reference away for now. And I'm going to go back in with um, a water-soluble pencil. I don't have a whole lot of tooth here. So I'm not really sure how strong these lines are going to be. But I'm going to put them in here anyway. They might end up dissolving when I hit them, but they're going to give me a they're going to give me a point to start with. Now you notice right now while I'm trying to draw these lines that are representational, I'm using a traditional grip on the pencil. Um, it's when I when I want to do these more expressive lines that I want that I shift up or I change my my grip a bit. Now I'm gonna move to this blue pencil that I love so much. in here and I probably should put some blue lines in the horse himself so let's let's do that okay this has got more of a feel of electricity to it I really like that there's there's definitely like something happening here and and I feel a, a stronger response to this than I did to the other piece or the other composition that we had. We still kind of have the wheel, the wheel thing happening. Um, lately I've been using a lot of circles in my uh, designs, in my paintings. I don't really understand why, but I'm not going to try to overthink that too much at this point. I'm just going to let that happen. I'm looking at this piece and I'm figuring out my next move. I'm thinking what I need to do is paint that eye. And once I get this eye in, that's going to bring this horse alive to me and I'm going to want to have a relationship with it or a conversation. It's easier to have a conversation with something that's looking back at you. So let's bring that reference photo back up. And um, one of the things that, whoop, that I like so much about this reference photo is that um, there's a lot of emotion in this eye. And I'm going to use it as a starting point, um, but I'm definitely going to roll it and uh, allow some of that white to show through because that adds a further element of expression to the piece. I 
again, I have my palette off camera. Wow, there's, I sanded all of the tooth off of this. My brush is not, my brush is not sticking at all. From one extreme to the other. Now we call, we call this the inner part of the eye, the white of the eye, but it really isn't white. It actually is full of blood vessels and it's quite pink. What makes it look so white is the contrast between the creaminess of the eyeball and the part of the eye that's pigmented. So resist reaching for a pure white and locking that in with a pure white because you just really, you don't want to do that. That's going to make it look flat and dead. And we want this to, we want this to be very alive and believable. my my finger in there I can lift the excess paint I can smudge edges around a bit and uh, make for a softer more interesting mark it's also going to give me soft edges shape isn't quite right, but I'm going to leave it for now. Let me try one other little wash of blue here. nice and deep and expressive and it almost looks like he's got bags under his eyes Ooh. which I can totally relate to now it's it's hard to deny that there's a presence here and this gives me the opportunity to start to have a conversation now the one other thing that I want to do is pick up this edge just like you saw me do with the mice this morning I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna pick this edge up and I'm gonna add some paint but first I want to soften this line because it's a water soluble, so I'm just hitting it with water and creating a wash there. Now I'm gonna go in with a lighter value and I'm just gonna kiss right up to that edge and pull it down. So even though my paint 
that I pulled from my palette hasn't changed. You can see how that mark has really changed as it, uh, as it picked up the pigment that was there. I'm gonna do a little bit of it right, right sort of right there. absolutely love this sort of uh, tealy color. So I'm going to brush some of it in. And I feel like it's created some great texture here. Maybe I need some of it up here too. Whoops. Nope, it's not the right color. Let's darken that a little bit. No, that's not the right color either. All right. So I want to try and lift this. I don't want to just wipe it straight out, but I do want to build a little bit of texture, so there. By texturizing this, these smoother marks, I'm making them kind of blend in to what we have going on there. And I do like that. Okay, so now I'm going to turn this off, because really what I want to do is respond to the painting not to my reference photo, because I'm not painting the reference photo, I'm painting an emotion. I think I want some more gold, kind of drizzling. Now I could go back to the, to the gold pen that I used, but, but differences are what draw the eye in. So, I'm going to mix up some paint and I, I'm just going to put some differences in here. I don't want everything to be matchy matchy. Matchy matchy is boring in a painting. I want, I want there to be some excitement. I want the viewer to step into this. And, and not want to walk away. And so in order to do that, I need to build in differences and surprises. Things that will... Things that will reward... Reward the viewer. idea who's at my door. Uh, cool, we got a delivery. Somebody sent us a present. Awesome. So I want this to sort of jump forward the edge of this neck, but I don't think I want to change any of these values or marks here. So what I want to do is gently shift or push that to be darker. So I'm going to do that. I'll start out with a little bit of glaze. And I'm just mixing it on my plate from earlier today. And let's see what happens here. I pull this out. That line is really beautiful when it gets softened. I'm going to pick some water up and see. Oh, yeah. Let's do the same to this end. 
as well. I have water soluble pencil here. I also have regular pencil and the blue. Yeah, I do like that. Now the next thing I want to do is sort of play with this wreath or wheel shape here. I'm going to do that with some glazes. My new favorite color is a golden one. And I can't even tell you what it's called. Let me pull it out and show you. Where is it? N3 Neutral Gray, for those of you who can read backwards. M3 Neutral Gray is my new favorite color. Whoops, and I just squirt stuff all over the floor. It's just a really wonderful neutral, and it's not super dark. Like, it's not black black, but it's nice and dark. And it's not so heavily pigmented that it, that it melts away other colors. Like, it plays well with others. It's not like a phthalo that really swallows up whatever else is in its company. This one is, I get some really beautiful neutrals with it. I found this one when I did a, um, I did an online workshop with Michael Carson. And uh, he works in oils and I work in acrylic. So I was trying to match, approximate, guess, because it was all online. So there were a lot of different factors in place, but guess at the sorts of uh, the actual colors that he was using and find approximations for them in my acrylics. And he used a marvelous neutral gray. And that's how I found this one. I, I love to tell my students to um, go out and look at what the artists you love are doing. Look at what they're doing. Pay attention to it. Even if you can't actively sit and ask them questions, study their work online. Figure out what they're doing. And then ask yourself how you might adapt that process to your own work. So for instance, by looking at the colors that Michael was using, even though I couldn't learn exactly what they were, well, there wasn't really an equivalent because I'm in acrylics, by um, studying what he did and how it reacted when he was mixing it and investigating other things, other colors, I was able to find something that did the same, had the same sort of reaction with my palette. So I, I took a process that he was using and I made it my own. So now there's there's a lovely shape coming out here that I that I find really beautiful. take a little break here and spritz my palette because it's drying out. And um, let's see what you guys have to say. If there's any questions. Sue. Sue, you are loving him and enjoying the process. Well, good. I am grateful for that. Like I said earlier today, I thought this would be a welcome distraction from doom scrolling and waiting for news. We can uh, take back our own feeds, right? Um, Anna. 
Anna Hong, I love seeing you show up on my feed. Thank you for watching. I'm so glad that you're here. Anna's one of my best friends from elementary school even. We go back a long, long ways. Hey Barb, I see you're asking if I'm left-handed. No, I'm not left-handed. Um, the camera has got everything reversed. So um, I'm actually right-handed. Yeah, he is coming alive, isn't he, Sue? I like this much better. I feel that there is a much deeper connection between this painting as it sits now and what I had this morning. Sometimes it takes a bit for the piece that you need the marks that you need to show up to make themselves known. Now, I know I'm gonna to have to tame down a lot of this texture from the sanding part. I have to figure out what I want to hold on to and what I want to let go. And that's just going to take some editing and a little bit of careful work. I also like to, like I mentioned before, build up the sorts of marks that one doesn't necessarily notice until they come right up on the piece. So even though I'm making these marks now with a small pencil and you maybe can't see them on the On the screen they're ultimately important because they tell they reward the viewer they tell the viewer that I care about them coming in closer that I want to reward them for coming in closer so this texture here is all pretty critically important. And I like that this is a light texture on a dark ground and down here I have dark texture on a light ground. So those two differences are nice. But meanwhile, what I wanna do is build up some darkness and make these lines kind of dance a little bit And so I'm asking myself how I can do that. And clearly the answer isn't immediately apparent. darks and see see what happens it's so pretty isn't it
wanted to do that in there. Since that is my focal point, it's important that that darkest dark sits in my focal point. I don't want to have another area of the painting be darker than that. It'll pull, it'll pull the eye away. marks that make the painting mine. Yes. Yes, so you are right. I love my lines and I love the variation in line styles that I that I can create. Ooh, look at how nice that is. Look at those stripes. And connecting some of these scratch lines up to drawn ones. CJ, sometimes you have to wait for the marks to show themselves. You are right. That is so, so true. Let's see what happens when I put Throat latch to be two, too dark. It makes it seem heavy. I think I must have used a phthalo blue on this earlier painting here because I really do feel like. There's a good amount of phthalo ness to this blue underneath, and I do love phthalo, so maybe I need to bring some of that back in. I don't have any on my palette right now. about painting abstractly versus representationally. You don't really have a preconceived trail of which direction you're going to go in. When one paints representationally, one can really our, our, our marks, our, our end result, let's call it that, our end result is already determined for us because we know the object is going to be recognizable. When, when we introduce abstraction and the element of, imagine, of imagination and an imaginative response, now we've just relinquished any sort of reliance on measurable guide points as to whether or not the piece is successful. Does that make sense? I'm not looking at something and figuring out if my mark is correct. I can't measure it visually against anything else out there in the world. All I can measure it against is, is my own internal my gut, does it feel right? And that can be a really difficult thing to learn to come to terms with.
Let's see this some water. Let's see if I can't get it to drip. Also, we'll just throw a little bit of this. It might be too big of a value jump, but let's figure it out and see. Pink, whenever you see pink in my paintings, pink is a magical color. To me, pink is magic and hope. So whenever I, whenever I pop some of that in, that's a message that I'm hoping, hoping to send the viewer. Feels a little bit forced or disconnected from the other marks around it, doesn't it? Let's see what we can do here to make it blend in a little bit more. I also feel that working upside down gives me the opportunity to work at shapes or look at shapes apart from labeling them or without labeling them. I'm going to hit this with a bigger spray bottle here. Um, so I'm not like putting a mark and saying this is a shoulder or this is 
this is a particular sort of muscle, I'm just able to make marks in response to what's already what's already there. really like these marks that happen here. I like them so much. Let's see if I can do something similar up here. sure that it's quite as successful. It certainly picks out the edge of that face. It's going to need a little bit more work, but that's okay. are being so kind and patient and sitting here and watching me work. Um, let's see. Gently take your time. I'm loving the upper part. This little bit of white is important, um, but right now it's too white. It doesn't have any color. It doesn't have any pigment to it. Um, color, color sits in the middle in the middle values. Um, it doesn't sit in the extreme in here. I have this little, I keep this clipped to my ease all the time. So this is a um, simple strip of values where we have our darkest darks and we have our lightest lights here. Um, color doesn't rest in black, nor does it rest in white. You find color right in here in the middle. So. I know I love color, and if I want this to feel like it's really alive, um, white and black to me feel dead. Um, they're void of color, and to me color is a form of expression. So I want to see color in my lightest lights and my darkest darks, which means that this can't be a pure white out of the tube. It has to be something else in order to carry some color with it. And the same goes for my shadows. Um, these may show up as pretty dark on your um, on your screen, but they're actually they're actually somewhere between these two values here. They're not as dark as my darkest dark, which means that I can put some pigment in them, and I, that makes it look more alive, at least to me. Um, that's just stylistically how I like to work. So I'm looking at this. And I really do, I love the value jump, and I know that this value jump is important because it also controls my viewer and their interaction with this eye, but this is too light for me. So at some point I'm gonna have to pull it down a couple value stops uh, so that I can introduce some more color in it and really make it alive. And ultimately, I want the viewer to look here, not here. So this has gotta be my focal point, and this has to play um, this is my best supporting actor mark. 
um, it's not going to, I don't want it to trump the eye. So that's something I need to think about. But yes, um, you're right, that is a very important mark and it's an important value jump. Um, look at how that's changing, I love it. I'm gonna flip this upside down because I have these drips and they're almost at the bottom of the page or the panel. I don't want all of them to go to the bottom of the panel. I want some of them to come back up. Again, it creates, you know, creates some interesting differences. So I'm going to reverse this and allow it to dry in the opposite, opposite vertical while I talk here. So um, thank you for all the kind things you guys are saying. Um, Sue, you're, I'm, I'm reading your comments in my head, and I should be reading them out loud. Sorry about that. Um, yes, we, so we had that same dialogue about, um, about this white spot in our heads, and you're saying maybe pink. Um, it, could, it could be. It could go towards a pink. I'm thinking, though, that this yellow here, these traces of gold, are, are pretty important, and that they might actually end up wrapping around this eye in some capacity, and if that's the case, then maybe I want this to be a form of yellow or gold. Um, I'm not gonna worry about it too much. I know I need to change it at this point, and that's really all that matters is that um, knowledge or that awareness of the, the change that's gonna happen. So I'm feeling this to see how wet it is, because I'd really like to put a layer of um, medium over it to work some more colors and to do some wet on wet, but um, I'm also trying to be cautious here based on how wet things got this morning. I don't like this predictable ear shape, and I'm actually, I wanna wipe it out. I can hint at the ear. Ooh, isn't that much prettier? There's just a little bit of a hint of it there, and there's some lovely little bits happening inside of it but that's that to me that's that's much stronger than just having that um predictable shape there and i think i may even want to take this edge out a little bit more there we go okay so <laughs> oh sue you are so funny don't apologize for your comments. I'm delighted that you're interacting and um, finding value in this. And aren't we having, isn't this way more fun than doom scrolling? Um, I think so. So I have to figure out this, this value jump. Is, is the muzzle going to be darker? I haven't really committed to the horse's color yet, and I don't have to. Um, because this is an abstracted piece, the horse can be any color I wish, he can carry any markings I wish, um, I get to make all the rules here. But I, I need to determine if I want this to be darker than its surrounding area or lighter, because right now, right here, there, there really isn't anything happening that, that is important that tells a story. Now, I could flatten this space out with less value jumps, but then it becomes an awful lot like that, which makes me feel like it's a traditional portrait head study on a ground. So I'm thinking maybe I want to sort of blend or pull this forward as though the horse's head is moving. Hmm. Something else to think about. Area has really changed a lot. Hmm. I think my next step is going to be to 
these value jumps, these marks are consistently light against a consistent dark. I need to model this and change that value jump so that there's a difference here. I don't want to erase it or eliminate it altogether, but I want to put some sort of glaze down here that's going to create less of a value jump. So let's let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that with some with some burnt umber. Well, maybe this is raw umber. I think it's raw. And that will also, because I'm taking it a little bit darker, it should kill some of the saturation of the blue. be obscured. So I'm coming in here with some opaque color. Let's see. Does that make a difference? I was fighting that lower edge as I made my marks, and I don't want to do that. So I want to be able to pull my brush right off the edge. And the best way to do that is to just rotate it and work on it this way. said I was working on that area, but look at what I had to just do. I try to change the color on my brush every time that I go back to my palette. Reload my brush. I want to change that color up just a little bit. It makes things way more interesting. Again, just another way of rewarding the viewer. From a distance, these marks are going to look pretty similar. But then the viewer is going to get in up close. sorts of things unexpectedly. similar in shape to the nose itself, so I'm going to rub it out.
also didn't like what was there beforehand. Yeah, not gonna work, so let's see if you would. This is just water, but it's a bigger, a bigger spray. So it's gonna change things up a little faster than the little one. So as scary as it was to take the um, to take the sander to this a little bit ago, ultimately it it completely changed this painting up. I think you can I think that you can see that it, it really altered altered the energy. And give you the opportunity to find a way to build a deeper connection with with my emotions that I started out with at the beginning of the night or the beginning of the day. Lucy, oh, I'm so glad that you got to check in after you picked your kids up from school. Uh, let's see. Okay. I'm going to pick up the pencil again. And I'm going to reintroduce some line elements here. I am thinking... I really want this, I want there to be a feeling of sort of torsion. I want to feel like this head is really getting swung about. So I'm going to go in with some lines and I'm just going to these will end up getting painted over or may not even show up very much but to me it's part of the intention Ooh, actually if that ear goes back instead of up and that line sort of just did it what if I put backwards ear there. That totally changes it, doesn't it? Yeah. I'm 
I'm trying to be careful not to make lines that are predictable or all the same. This is a um, water soluble pencil that I'm using, and I'm wiping it off periodically on my um, on my rag here because it's peeling up some of the it's peeling up some of the paint. carve it through as I carve these lines and it lifts up a good maybe you can see if I bring it in here where's the camera and maybe you can't see but there's a good amount of paint around that so I'm gonna try to wipe that off periodically Ooh, let's scratch some lines and that some stripes that looks cool okay now I've put a lot of lines in here with that graphite I want to put just a few in with the blue sharpen this. I'm going to do, um, do do a circle here. I kind of think of these circles as war paint in a way. sure that I have this throat lash quite. It feels too trite, so I'm going to pull my reference up again and I'm going to look at it. Oh yeah, so let's see. It comes across here, back, just look at come back let's look at that muzzle I feel like I need to put the nostril in but I think I want it more flared and again because I'm doing this in a in an abstracted manner I can get away with it not being totally true. And I'm going to bring this back and I'm going to draw this and draw this edge a little bit truer. And I'm changing the set of the shin a little bit to make it a bit more determined. But I feel like that edge is kind of important. And now is the point where I can continue to make tiny marks and keep things super precious. Or I can just go big. And bold. And 
what is going to make painting more exciting? Safe marks will make the painting safe. And I'm not really feeling safe. So, here goes. This is straight up acrylic paint. I'm applying it with a spatula. Paint is going on pretty darn thick. Because it's thick, I have a little bit of time to work it. Before it dries. Getting to that point in my palette too where I need to uh, replenish some of my colors. probably should stop to do my colors, but I get so caught up in the process that I don't want to. I said I liked the dark marks, the dark marks on the lighter ground down here, and then I didn't want to lose them, but then I kind of have, so let's see if I can, there we go, some of them are coming back. I feel like this vein, there's a central vein here that's important. That vein of gold. Actually, no, let's, let's change it up. All right.
more than what I wanted. Got a little bit of that carrying my eye, carrying the viewer's eye. Nope, that's too bright. Okay, you know what? I'm going to lift that out. This is just a paint scraper tool. It's like a rubber, flexible rubber edge. And it's lifting the majority of the paint. There was so much paint there. I'm not a fan of that yellow space. Let's see if we can. I have to be careful because there's so much wet paint around this. Let me just grab my rag. brayer and I am going to Too much, too much visual noise happening here. So I'm going to take some of it out. careful here because there's a good amount of uh, thick paint down. I'm going to carry some scratch marks into it and some lines because that paint is so thick and I don't want it to be like the only uninterrupted Mark, that one's kind of thick too. I feel like this noise right here has to go. And that's what I was trying to do with this color that I mixed, this baby poop color. It just wasn't quite right. Let's try it with a paintbrush. Let's see what happens when I calm that that area down. I don't think that's quite the right color. But it definitely uh, is soothing, right?
those spaces up, I'm careful to leave little pockets of what's underneath it. I do want to mark in there to represent that ear, the darker ear. So I think you get a sense of the push and pull and how I build this up. I'm getting to a point now where this piece is really wet and it's got to dry for a bit um, because if I continue to draw and scratch into it, I'm going to be lifting up a lot more from the surface than I really want. Um, let me take a look and see what you guys have to say, though. Comments are coming so fast that I can't get my screen to freeze and let me read them. Judy, you love how she's a helpful, hopeful exploding heart shape. I hadn't seen the heart shape. I see it now. You're right. You're right. I love that. Thank you for catching that and seeing that. Sometimes we get so caught up in what we're working on that we don't really see, um, see the whole picture. It's one of the things that I really enjoy about sharing and process images on Facebook or social media is that it, it forces me to pause and look at the piece in a different way. Um, and it, I take a photo of it, I put it up on social media, and um, it gives me distance and fresh eyes as well as the opportunity to hear what other people say. So that's always really helpful. It's a big part of the process. Sue, the best time spent this week. Thank you for that. It's only Tuesday, though. Hopefully things will get better, right? I'm the same. Thing. Yes, there there is a dynamism and a force to this, and um, I'm going to continue continue to try to bring that out. I have to figure out where my focal point is, how much of this noise I want to continue to preserve, and I really think there needs to be some more line work in here. Um, and I'm thinking the the stronger line work might have to come here around that muzzle is a counterpoint for these darks that are up here. But I, I also want to really pull this eye out, maybe right inside the war paint circle, really make that um, super alive and make this war paint itself um, thicker and heavier, uh, maybe even drippier or oozier uh, to, to really accent because I love that there's there's the circle of the eye, there's a circle of the war paint, there's a circle of the cheekbone and the forehead, and then there's this bigger circle of external forces. So I, I love that pattern, that repeated motif that's happening there. Sue, your enthusiasm is definitely, definitely contagious. I love it. Um, 
So yeah, I'm gonna turn the video off now and I would say that this is the end of my demo on this particular piece. I wanna thank everybody for tuning in and watching with me. I really, really appreciate that and I'm really grateful and I hope that the remainder of your Tuesday is um, peaceful and enjoyable. If you want to see the rest of this painting process, I will most likely do um, at least one more film on it and share it over in my Patreon classroom. So you have an opportunity to see how I finished this. Um, I don't know that I'll, I'll paint active painting process, but I will do a commentary and a critique of it in process as well as another one of it when it's finished. Um, and perhaps also sometimes I do it in the context of other pieces that I'm working on just so that you can see the relationship of some commonalities or um, shared threads or ideas that, that weave through the work. Um, again, if you're interested in joining my Patreon classroom, it's an online classroom, self-studied, um, all downloadable content delivered to your inbox so you don't have to go on social media for it, which is a huge, huge plus right now. Um, shoot me a message. There's information on my Facebook page as well as on my website. Um, the classroom space is $5 a month. That's, that's a cup of coffee. It's nothing. I want it to be really affordable um, for people during these times um, and for creatives in general to um, go out and find inspiration and uh, be part of a community of fellow minds. So $5 a month is a Patreon space. There will be more follow-up on this, on this piece over there. Um, this piece will also be for sale. I feel like I'm doing a sales pitch here, and I hate that. Um, but I always get these questions after the fact, and I wish that I had addressed them in the video. So this piece will eventually be for sale when it's done. So if you are interested in that, please also reach out to me, um, and uh, I will give you the details. I'll have to measure. I think I said it's 18 by 24, and look at my price list, but my work is priced based on size So um, in substrate. So I'm going to guess... I'm guessing that this is around $7.49, but I'm not sure. So I'll have to double check that. Don't, don't hold me to it. Um, and I will also include an update on my um, Facebook page and probably over on Insta too later on today because I think it's still, it's still kind of early. We're at 3.30, so I do still have some time to work um, once it dries and I have an opportunity to sit with it. But um, I'm really grateful to have been able to share such a big chunk of my day with you today through these two separate in-process videos and I'm really grateful for your companionship and uh, comment, commentary comments as I, as I worked on this piece, as we worked on it together. So thank you for that. So I'm gonna sign off. I hope you have a wonderful day and that I see you soon in some capacity on my social media or over on Patreon. Thanks everybody, bye.